Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our 2024 ACA presentation. My name is Renee Contemelio. I'm an HCM benefits specialist here at CTR, and we're joined by Anne LaBelle, our expert in legal compliance and all that great stuff that comes with the ACA. So with that, we will jump right in. All right, so on the agenda today, we'll have some legislative updates by Anne. We'll talk about reporting deadlines, how to preview your forms if you're using iSolved, some common ACA issues that might come up year to year, and then finally, how to approve your forms. All right, so just some uh, housekeeping at the beginning. All participants are muted for this webinar. We will review at the end where to direct any questions once we're through. We'll also be sending this presentation out to everyone on the call. Um, please be sure to register for the rest of our webinars this year. There are some great ones coming up. You can find these on your client landing page. And then in addition, we have a year-end resource page for you that you can find at ctrhcm.com. Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ann, and thanks for joining us this morning. And yeah, I handle all the fun uh, compliance stuff here because uh, compliance is always fun. In the event, how many of you knew that the ACA is a decade old? So this year marks 10 years of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and it certainly has evolved over the last decade. Uh, we are at an all-time high enrollment each year, I say that, and each year it keeps growing with respect to the number of people in the marketplace. So right now, we're a little over 21 million people enrolled through a marketplace. That's not an employer-sponsored plan. That's either a federal or state marketplace where they're likely to get uh, some type of subsidy uh, for the cost of their health insurance. And we have another 18 million enrolled in the expanded Medicaid program. So that's roughly 40 million people that uh, are benefited by this program, by this law that's now 10 years old. And over the last 10 years too, we have seen the uninsured rate in the United States drop from about 6.5% to 3.4%. And those are interesting statistics that are out there, whether you like the ACA or not, that is the impact that it has had on our country. The biggest legal case, so because the ACA is a whole decade old, and I, I'm old enough, I can certainly remember when it came out and all the hubbub about it, there were tons of legal challenges, almost all of which failed. And so as we move down the timeline here and we're 10 years into this, we're getting very few legal challenges, so there's a lot less to update about. But the most interesting one at the moment is out of the Fifth Circuit, which is down in Texas. Texas is known for being extremely conservative in, in terms of their courts, and I don't get political, I'm just sort of telling you or explaining the way that court system works, is they tend to be very employer friendly. And a group of employers challenged the rule within the ACA that preventative care has to be covered at 100%. Um, this includes basically all the services recommended by the U.S. Task Preventive Service um, Task Force. It includes annual exams, mammography, uh, colonoscopy, stuff like that, that um, they recommend to screen for cancer or yearly health vaccines, different things like that. This was challenged by employers who said, hey, we don't agree with some of the preventive recommendations. You're making us buy into it. We shouldn't have to, it's not fair. Some of them said, hey, it goes against our religious faith because we have to provide coverage for like HIV or STD testing. And we don't buy into that from a faith-based standpoint and we shouldn't have to pay for this. <clears throat> so in any event, the court in Texas, the federal court in Texas, uh, which is the Fifth Circuit, it's one step below the Supreme Court, agreed with the employers. 
and said, hey, we agree. We don't think you should be forced to pay for preventive care. And not surprisingly, uh, the Biden administration has appealed this to the Supreme Court. We don't have argument dates for this. This ruling only applies within the Fifth Circuit, which is Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. If the Supreme Court agrees with the Fifth Circuit, it will, it will apply nationwide. So we will see what happens there. The interesting part statistically is that we know that free preventive care actually saves insurers usually money because problems are caught earlier and not when they're in a crisis mode where extensive treatment is required. In any event, we will see how this plays out. But that is out there, and that is one of the cases that has had the most traction against the ACA uh, in recent history. So the other sort of national thing that has occurred as an update, and this is certainly um, a political hot potato, and again, we're not trying to be political here, just sort of reporting what has happened, is the um, Health and Human Services uh, Agency, which enforces the ACA, has essentially said the ACA prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, age, disability, or sex, and then has clarified that sex includes pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, and sex characteristics. This is also being challenged, challenged legally. This same um, expansive definition of sex is also true in like the Title IX college setting. It, it is set up for the Supreme Court to be decided, I'm sure, because that definition is woven into so many federal regulations, including this one now. Some other sort of interesting information is the marketplace premiums are expected to increase by approximately 6% this year. The range historically has been between two and 10%, so more or less on average there. We mentioned this last year, but it's still worth noting because Renee's gonna go over a bunch of stuff that you have to do. And you want to do it because the IRS has said there's no statute of limitations on these penalties if you fail to do it. So you want to do it. And the IRS has also made clear that if you fail to pay your penalties, they will put liens on your property and every other thing. Um, so you don't want that as an employer. Last but not least, uh, every year the penalties go up. <clears throat> so the, what's called the A penalty has increased to 2,970, which is roughly $247 a month per employee if you fail to offer minimum essential coverage. Um, the B penalty is now 4,460 or $372 a month for failure to offer coverage that meets minimum value or affordability standards per employee, uh, assuming those employees go and get a tax credit from the marketplace. So keep in mind, these penalties continue to grow. Some of you may have made decisions about whether to offer coverage or not based on whether the penalties were less money than the insurance. And as these penalties continue to grow, you may wanna revisit that decision. So those are the updates for this year. And I'll turn it back to Renee here. All right, thank you so much, Anne. Um, with that, your ACA reporting deadlines this year so the IRS is saying you, requires that you have the 1095C or 1095B statements out to your employees no later than March 3rd of 2025. That's the last day they can be postmarked. As far as your filing goes, those statements, those employer statements must be filed electronically by March 31st this year. So from our end here at CTR and from your end, um, start previewing your forms now. There's no sense in waiting until January to say, oh, this is not right, or these have a lot of mistakes. Um, yeah, we still have a couple months left, but please start previewing your ACA forms now. And then for you to approve, your forms must be approved by January 9th of 2025. So once you approve your forms, they're gonna come over to us at CTR. We will print them, we will mail them before that deadline, and we will file them electronically with the IRS. 
Great, so getting to how to preview your forms. Um, this is not changed from last year. If you are using iSolved, you're still going to go to your ACA forms approval page. Make sure you're selecting 2024, not last year. And don't forget if you have multiple FEINs, you will need to preview separately for each of those companies. So to try to catch errors right off the top, the run alerts option is a condensed version of your forms. These are for fully insured plans. If you're self-insured, you should preview forms. So run alerts is if you have fully insured medical plans, you'll want to preview forms if you're self-insured. That's because you want to be able to review that dependent information that's required if you're self-funded. So the run alerts report, this will highlight for you any potential errors that might cause the IRS to reject your electronic submission. So the report will highlight in yellow any potential errors. These are things that you just wanna take a closer look at. So perhaps you put in a dummy social security number that will be highlighted, okay? Anything in red means the IRS is not even gonna accept your form. The error is so bad that it's just gonna get spit back out again. So when you're reviewing your forms, you take it from the top. You're gonna wanna look at your legal name, double check your address, all that fun stuff. And this information is pulling directly from your company profile in iSalt. When you get down to line 18, that's the total number of forms that you're actually submitting. That should match the total number of your 1095 forms. Line 21 is gonna tell you, are you a member of an aggregate group? Do you have multiple legal companies with common ownership? It should say yes, if you have more than one FEIN. Line 22, this is going to populate based on what you chose under your ACA report options. And we're gonna look at that a little more. But these are your certifications, certifications of eligibility. So those are something that if you're not sure if you are eligible for one of those certifications, you can always check with your broker. So at CTR, we do pre-populate these forms for you based on your prior reporting year. Okay. All right, certifications of eligibility. So there's two different certifications. A is your qualifying offer method. So in order to qualify for this certification, you must have made a qualifying offer to one or more of your full-time employees for every single month in which that person was full-time. The plan also must be offered to spouse and dependents. If you qualify for certification D, that's the 98% offer method. So that means that the company offered a qualifying health plan to 98% of its full-time employees and their dependents. The full-time employees offer of self-only coverage is affordable according to the ACA. So if you check that box, you are not going to see a full-time employee count on part three. It's just not required. And I wanna point out that neither of these certifications are required, but you should report if you are eligible to denote that you met one of these two certifications. All right, so going down again on your 1094, if you have more than one FEIN that's part of your aggregate or your common ownership reporting group, make sure that all your FEINs are included. Even if they're not in ISOL, you still need to report the name of that company and the EIN, okay? If you're using ISOL, it's very simple. You can just add your additional FEINs on your ACA reporting groups page. If you need to manually edit your 1094C form, you can do that also on your ACA report options. 
You can simply click on the employer overrides and make those edits. When you're reviewing your 1095C forms, you kind of read them like a story, okay? Um, line 14 is what the company did. Did the company offer coverage? Line 15 is going to populate how much that coverage would cost for the employee only option, the lowest cost option, regardless of what the employee elected. So those monetary values in line 15 might not be what the, the employee actually paid per month because the ACA cares about the lowest cost employee only option that was offered. Line 16 is the employee's response. Did the employee accept coverage or not? If they, if they waived coverage, was it affordable? So line 14, what did the company do? Line 15, how much did it cost per month for that lowest cost option? Line 16, what did the employee do? Common line 14 codes. So this is the one where, you know, what the company is doing. So a 1A means that you offered a really inexpensive plan that was under the federal poverty line. So the employee did not have to pay more than that federal poverty line limit to enroll in that coverage. If you have a code 1A, you don't even put a monetary value in, in line 15. The IRS knows that it was very affordable. It meets all of the, the affordability parameters and they don't even care how much it costs because it was that inexpensive to the employee. A 1E means that it might not have been affordable. So I saw will auto populate that monetary monthly value if you have a code 1E. So 1A, no monetary value. 1E, you will report the monetary value. Um, there's some other codes like a 1G which means that the employee wasn't full-time for any month during that reporting year, but they were enrolled in self-insured coverage. Okay, so that's basically you offer coverage to somebody who's not an employee, maybe a retiree, for example. 1H is no offer of coverage. Anytime you have a 1H, you need to explain why you did not offer coverage to someone. 1J, those are your conditional offers. Um, that's when you conditionally offer coverage to spouse and you don't offer it to dependents. So that offer, you know, it's a conditional offer is an offer that's subject to some reasonable objective conditions. For example, um, you can offer it only to an employee spouse if the spouse is not eligible for coverage under Medicare or another group health plan. A 1K is when the offer of coverage to an employee and coverage is conditionally offered to the spouse and you're offering it to dependents. And I know these codes can be a little tricky. The most common ones though are a 1A, a 1E, and a 1H. And on our ACA help guide, we get into very specific explanations of all the different types of codes that you might see, okay, depending on your particular circumstance. So those conditional offers that we just talked about, if you're offering a plan with a conditional offer of coverage to spouses, just let us know and we can make sure that that's denoted on your benefit plan setup so the appropriate code will automatically populate for you. And it's very simple. It's a simple checkbox saying this plan is a conditional offer of coverage for the spouse and the code will pre-populate according to that rule. All right, line 16. So this is what the employee does with that offer. Some very common codes that you'll see, a 2A means they weren't employed during any day of that month. A 2B means they're not full-time or they termed during that month. 
A 2C, they accepted that offer of coverage. A 2D is when they're in that waiting period, either a probationary period, or they're still being measured under your measurement policies. A 2F and 2H are your safe harbor codes. Both of those codes mean the employee waived coverage, but that coverage was affordable. So what you offered was affordable to the employee. They didn't waive because it was too expensive. So if we give a little example here of employees in a look back or an initial measurement period, this is our Acme Corporation. They use a 12 month initial measurement period for all of their variable of our employees. So this employee, for example, was still in his initial measurement period for the first six months of 24. Then he reaches his full-time hours according to ACA and he qualifies for an offer of coverage in June. He does not accept that coverage, he waives, but the coverage was affordable to him under his rate of pay safe harbor. So if we look at him like a story, in January through May, the company does not offer him coverage. In line 16, the reason why is he's still being measured. Then in June, the company offers coverage. It would have cost the employee for the lowest cost employee only option. It would have cost him $200 a month. The employee waives that coverage, but it was affordable to him. So another example, this company's plan year renews in July. For the prior plan year, this employee was qualifying as full-time and was offered coverage. For the next plan year, he doesn't qualify as full-time. He did not meet his hours. So his codes would be as follows. So January through June, the company offers him coverage, a code 1E. That coverage would have cost him $200 a month. The employee waives that coverage, but it was affordable. Come July, the employee goes back to part-time. The company does not offer him coverage, 1H. And the reason why is he's part-time. You don't have to offer him coverage. So in order for ISOL to correctly populate your forms for these variable hour employees, you need to make sure you have ACA measurement policies in ISOL. So we at CTR do audit those once a year to make sure you have measurement policies set up, but you also should be looking at this as part of your annual ACA checklist. We're gonna have that checklist posted to our year end page. If you don't have measurement policies set up or they're not set up properly according to your plan year, then you need to override all of your forms with those code 2Ds for people who are still being measured to override for people who have met their hours for ACA, and you would have to override for employees who didn't meet their hours. All those would require manual adjustments. We wanna make this as automated as possible for you. So it's very simple. You just wanna make sure you audit your ACA measurement policies and let the system pre-populate those hours for you. If you ever do need to manually edit your ACA forms, um, you would need to do this, for example, if you offer a jointly sponsored union plan. You can manually override any employee's ACA form. Um, all you do is you go to the employee, ACA report overrides, pick your reporting year, choose your codes, and save. So it's pretty simple if you need to manually override. Now we talked about the code 1A for that super inexpensive plan. So again, that code 1A means you offered coverage that month. You're only gonna see a 1A on your ACA forms if that employee contribution for the self-only coverage is equal or less than the IRS rules. 
So per the IRS rules, the top premium for an employer's lowest cost cell phone lead coverage is $101.94 a month. So if the employee contribution is $101.94 a month or less, you're going to see a code 1A. And again, you will not even report the monetary value on line 15 because that code 1A tells the IRS that, yeah, it's affordable. If you have a code 1E, you're offering that coverage to the employee and their dependents, but it's above that $101.94 a month. Okay, even just a penny or two more, you're going to see a code 1E. If you have a code 1E or, or any other offer of coverage other than that 1A, you are going to see a monetary value. You also do not want to see blanks in line 16. Okay, a blank in line 16, when you have a code 1E, that means the employee waived coverage, but the coverage was too expensive according to their pay history and didn't qualify for one of those safe harbor codes. So you want to see if you have a 1E, you either want to see a 2C saying, yes, the employee accepted the offer, or you want to see a 2F or a 2H, which means they waived coverage, but it was affordable to them. All right, so common issues, no offer of coverage. When you have a 1H, you always need to have a reason why. 1H means you didn't offer coverage. In line 16, you need to explain why you didn't offer coverage. If you see a blank in line 16, that can leave you exposed to a penalty. So some common codes that you should have if you don't offer coverage would be a 2A, you didn't offer coverage because they didn't work for you. Or a 2B, you didn't offer coverage because they weren't full time. Or a 2D, you didn't offer coverage because the employee is still in a waiting period. If you have a 1H and a blank, this is resolved very easily by correcting the employee's employment history and ISOLT. So when you have an employment category change, you never want to overwrite the employee's existing employment record unless you made a mistake, of course, correct it. But you always want to add a new line for their employment category. You want to be able to tell when they were part-time and when they switched to full-time or vice versa. So all employees have to be assigned their correct employment category historically with an effective date as well. So this employee in this example has blanks for January through March because there was no employment category assigned from January through March in ISOL. ISOL doesn't know if they work for you, if they didn't work for you. So please don't overwrite their existing employment categories, always add new. Another common issue, employees marked as inactive. So employees marked as inactive and not terminated and ISOLD can generate some errors. Um, the ISOLD ACA forms don't know what to do with an inactive employee. Um, are they on leave and still eligible for coverage? Are they termed and not eligible? So they're just going to pull as blank and you'll need to review them. ISOLD will assume these employees were eligible and offered coverage, but you would need to audit that. So best practice is if you want your forms to record the proper codes for the month the employee is inactive, you want to terminate them in ISOLD on their general screen and then use your rehire button when they do ultimately come back to work. COBRA offers. So COBRA, we all have to do it. If you're a fully insured, if you have a fully insured plan, you generally do not have to record COBRA offers if your plans are fully insured. 
The one exception are employees who have a reduction of hours and are offered COBRA coverage. So if that is the situation and you need to report COBRA offers for a reduction of hours, you would go to your ACA report override screen for that employee. You would add new, just like we looked at before, and enter the appropriate codes, okay? For the months that the employee was offered or enrolled in COBRA, only for a reduction of hours, you would enter your appropriate code. So 1A, you offered a super inexpensive plan, a 1E, or 1B, a 2C if they enrolled, a 2B if they part-time and waived. And again, I know these codes can be lengthy, but we have them all listed out for you. Um, Want to point out that you only need to override codes that you're changing. You don't have to mess with anything else and then hit save. So fully insured, only worry about that for your active employees who had a reduction in hours and who were offered COBRA. If you have a termed employee who was offered COBRA, you do not worry about this, okay, if you're fully insured. So this example from the IRS, this employee was offered COBRA coverage with a fully insured plan after his hours were reduced, okay? You would need to override. You would enter a code 1E for the family COBRA coverage offer. You would enter a 1B if the COBRA offer was only to the employee as in this example, all right? So January through October, this person's full-time. 1E, you offer him coverage. It would cost him $150 a month. He is enrolled in your company sponsor plan January through October. A 2C means he accepted that offer. Then come November, he has a reduction in hours. The company offers himself only COBRA coverage. That's your 1B. And then he accepts that offer. He enrolls in that COBRA coverage. So you have your 2C again saying you offered, he accepted. One more COBRA example. This employee was offered COBRA coverage for reduction of hours and did not enroll. So again, you're offering that coverage, a 1E for family COBRA coverage, as in this example, um, like we looked at before, it'd be a 1B for self only. And then in this case, for November and December, you'll see a code 2B denoting they were part-time, but waived. They did not enroll in that coverage, okay? So for self-insured plans, you do need to report COBRA coverage, not just for, for the reduction of hours, but also for your terminated employees. So for your self-insured plans, you follow the same things that the fully insured folks do with one exception. So there's part three of your form that needs to be completed for your overrides for all months the employee and dependents were covered by that self-insured health plan, including through COBRA. And we'll look at this. For your terminated employees, you also need to report for the months the employee was termed, even if the employee enrolled in COBRA, you do report a 1H, no offer, and a 2A, in line 16. These, these codes will auto-populate for you too if you're using ISOL. Just make sure that you check off the coverage override boxes for every month the employee and dependents were actually covered on your self-insured health plan, including through COBRA. All right, so here we go. For your part three, this is the manual overrides just for self-insured plans, just for COBRA coverage. So the COBRA coverage for termed employees and reduction of hours need to be reported, right? And you need to use your ACA override screen. So what you'll want to do is go down to your employee, look at the coverage overrides, and then simply check the box 
for all months, the employee or their dependents were covered by your self-insured health plan, including through COBRA. So in this example here, we have Jacob. He was termed in September. He has, you know, the company has a self-insured plan. He termed in September and he enrolled in COBRA through the end of the year, okay? All you're gonna do is in part three down here, check the box for all the months Jacob was enrolled in coverage, including through COBRA. Part two is gonna pre-populate for you, but part three requires that manual override to denote when Jacob was enrolled in your self-funded coverage, including COBRA. All right, um, if you need further guidance on COBRA coverage, the IRS has a ton of different examples and other types of scenarios that might fit into what you're looking at. So I put a link in here, questions and answers, you know, for the IRS as well. Then lastly, after you go through your forms, you've completed everything. Everything looks accurate. Employment categories are there. You want to make sure you don't forget to approve your form. So like we talked about at the beginning, review your forms now, approve them no later than January 9th. Approve your forms on your ACA forms approval screen. Remember, if you preview now, you can avoid errors and headaches later. You can refer to our year-end guide, which is gonna be posted and also our annual ACA checklist for you, which will be posted. Um, just a, a reminder for ISOL clients, if you have employees who have opted out of receiving a paper W-2 this year, they will also receive an electronic ACA form. So the ACA forms uh, match up with whatever the employees selected for their W-2s. If you have questions specific to certain employees, please email our ACA at ctrhcm.com queue. Thank you for participating again this year, and we're very excited to help you get through year end. So thank you so much, and we will talk to you soon. And this is Anne again, just chiming in. We have two end of year seminars that I'm doing in November and December. They're always the second Thursday of the month and we're gonna do sort of a year end roundup. So please join us for those two. Take care.